Okay, hello, hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of Love Fruit Podcast. And today uh, we have another special guest joining us all the way from Arizona in the US, and that's Ronnie Scudero. And um, Ronnie's been into the raw food lifestyle for about 20 years, and him and his his wife Min have taught at the Living Light Culinary Arts Institute. They've done special trainings for corporations teaching people about raw foods. They also run a farm and a bed and breakfast out there in Arizona, and they try and introduce raw foods to, to people through that. And I came across them on Facebook, I think, as you would share excellent posts about the food that your wife was making you and uh, and about the fun you were having um, on a raw vegan diet. So, Ronnie, I'd, uh, I'm really glad that you've uh, you joined us today. I think this is going to be very interesting. I don't know a lot about you yet, but I'm looking forward to learning more. Great. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to talk to your guests. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, where did this start for you? Did you, were you brought up in a, in a kind of health conscious household or anything like that? No, quite the opposite. Uh, I was brought up in, I would call a typical American household, but I was born in 1949. Mm -hmm. And a lot of things started happening right about that time. That was when TV first started out. It was when commercials you know, first appeared on mm -hmm. television and, and when mass food marketing really started. So I was exposed to really the worst food. Mm -hmm. uh, we had things called TV dinners. I don't know. Sure. It, yeah. And so it was basically <laughs> a bad food cooked in an aluminum container, which we now know is one of the worst ways you can prepare food wow. to human consumption is to cook it, have it, have, it, have anything to do with aluminum. <laughs> and these things were cooked in the aluminum. You ate them out of the aluminum. And they were a huge hit back then because uh, my mom didn't have to cook food anymore. She could just toss that thing in the oven, heat it up. Yeah. And they advertised it as healthy. So I grew up eating all the worst junk, uh, <laughs> you know, bologna sandwiches on white bread with mayonnaise and a bag of potato chips, which is my standard lunch in school there almost mm -hmm. every single day. Mm-hmm. And I lived that way until I was about, um, really until I was about 22, 23 years old. And uh, I met a girl that I fell in love with. And one of the first things she told me, she said, you have to know that I'm a vegetarian. Because back then, vegetarian was considered, you know, very strange. Sure. It was not an accepted thing. It was nothing that we heard about in school. And anyway, when she said that, you know, I looked into her eyes and I said, Wow, that's unbelievable because I'm a vegetarian too. <laughs> <laughs> so I became a vegetarian that day instantly because I wanted to pursue this girl, which I did. And we had a wonderful relationship and she was a 100% vegetarian, mm -hmm. a junk vegetarian, which I came to learn later on, you know, what, what a yeah. junk vegetarian is. And so was I. I became a junk vegetarian immediately. And I lived that way. I went on after we broke up our relationship. You know, we were young and uh, I went on to live that way for, you know, I, I just kept on living the, the vegetarian lifestyle. I got used to it. I didn't want anything to do with eating animals, but I was eating a heavily, heavily junk, you know, pizza, sure. cheese pizza was considered healthy vegetarian, which is mm -hmm. that's terrible. But anyway, and I, I lived that way for many, many years. And then, um, Later on in life, I, I, how I became a raw foodist was I, I was an executive for a big spa, the Oasis Resort, and I was basically running the place. And um, I was really interested, I got really heavily into how the food that we were serving and how we were making it and where it was coming from and everything about it. And I learned everything from top to bottom, where the suppliers, where we came, got the food, where they got the food from. And, um, as I'm as I'm learning all of, all of this stuff about the food, uh, I decided that I wanted to open up a fast food franchise based on vegetarian food, and mm -hmm. not even vegan, just vegetarian. Yeah. And I researched it totally. Uh, uh, you know what it would take, and I and I and I kept thinking about doing it. And in my research, I I was asking uh, some people about anybody who had done this before or who might have had some success with it, and I was. I was steered towards a lady named Barbara Rogers, mm -hmm. who was a herbologist. I believe she still is. And she had a she had a pretty well known company that made uh, herbs, 
herb uh, makeup and, and lotions sure. and potions for women and for men. And that was she was she was the one who made the recipes. That was her, and she started this company. And anyway, so I was told that she had opened a vegetarian restaurant in Las Vegas, Nevada. So I went to meet Barbara, and it turns out that it wasn't a vegetarian restaurant. It was a raw restaurant. Oh, wow. And I had never even heard of raw food at this time. This would have been um, right around, you know, 1998, something mm -hmm. like that. Anyway, and so when I meet her, she started telling me what raw food was and what it was all about. And I just you know, immediately became fascinated with this. And she told me that she had, uh, she was going to open this, uh, had opened this small food restaurant in Las Vegas. And she partnered with the girl who is, I don't know if you know, Chef Giuliano. Have you heard of Chef Giuliano? Yes. Well, his, have, yeah. oh, well, his sister is named Kara. Yes. Have you heard of Marcus Rothkant? Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Okay, well, Marcus is a uh, significant other. And Marcus, I love him. He's a dear friend of mine. His significant other is Kara, mm -hmm. who, whose brother is Giuliano. And they and she and her opened up the first raw food restaurant uh, in the modern United States. There was one back in the uh, 30s and 40s that was quite famous in Southern California. But she opened one in San Francisco before anybody else in the United States did. Uh, uh, terrific foresight and uh and so anyway barbara and with the help of of uh, carol was good uh, is going to open up this uh rest is had opened this restaurant in las vegas and put together a menu and so i learned about it and i became totally fascinated about it and then i started studying it and there was a few people out there the bachenkos were the tenkos excuse me I uh -huh. it. Uh, they were going around the country when back when they were husband and wife and they were lecturing about it a little bit then and i think david wolf was talking about it uh, yeah part of his, his deal and uh, so i researched everything i could and of course sherry was out there she had uh, i think she was had was, she was just starting to to uh, put together living light culinary arts institute she uh -huh. was doing trainings and then so anyway so uh, so i became fascinated by it and then i just jumped into it 100 percent, and uh i just you know Got everything that I could find. Every book that came out about raw food, I just devoured. Mm -hmm. And of course, when I met my wife, the whole new world of raw food opened up to me because she grew up in Vietnam in the jungle in Vietnam, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and she didn't have electricity. Her mother, she was the youngest of eight children, growing up in a household with, with a single mother, no father. Yeah, and and they they had to live off of raw food they didn't have a refrigerator wow. they didn't have and they didn't have any way you know to to to, to and they were buddhists which and their sect of buddhism was very heavily into uh, vegan totally wow. totally vegan mm -hmm. and so you combine that with having to eat fresh food and <laughs> you're a raw foodist without even knowing what raw food was and the and i learned i learned how to make raw food myself uh, since i forgot and everything because my wife doesn't allow me to make it yeah. anymore but but even after i learned everything that was out there about raw food when i learned my wife's style it is totally different than anything that, the, the raw food that you're used to yeah but anyway that's basically how i got into it and uh it's been a fantastic uh, thing and a journey in my life in addition to my life at 71 mentally and spiritually i feel like i'm 17 i really do and physically I mean, I'm in good shape. I, you know, I got my little trampoline behind me. We walk every day. We exercise. So I'm in pretty good shape. But at 71, I can honestly say that I think I feel better physically than I did when I was a junk vegetarian at age 35. So you didn't have any specific, like, uh, health issues or anything that came up that got you into raw. It's it more like you, you just happened to kind of, you were open to the information. You met people um, coincidentally. And it just made sense to you and you sort of embraced it. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Interesting. You know, no health issue uh, forced me into it. And tell, tell, tell us about some of the benefits you've felt um, with, with the raw food lifestyle. Well, if I had to sum it up into two words, I would say I feel cleaner and lighter, but right. I feel like I've cleaned. I, 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 I mean, I went into it and I, 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 followed the seen gospel of peace uh, uh, instructions for getting into a raw food diet. I fasted, 
Mm-hmm. I tried to clean myself out and get rid of as much junk as I could through fasting. And then I, I started with a real simple diet and I, I added to it all, you know, as, as I got into it. But I, I've noticed that my, my energy level is better. My clarity level of thinking, of physicality, you know, as far as you know, eating, going, the body functions and cycles of, mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. releasing the food, everything is better. Yeah. Uh, and, and I have to say that after really learning about it and following my instincts and never stopping to learn that it is so much simpler. Yeah, I can go anywhere in the world, probably. I mean, I've never been out of the United States except for one day in Canada and one day in Mexico. But I, but I can go anywhere in the United States and find a supermarket and I can find I can feed myself. I can find food. Yeah. I can find greens. And, and it's so simple because I can just eat up a fruit if I if I want to and feel fantastic. And and many mm-hmm. days that's what I do. But uh, I I can my wife can put together a fantastic gourmet meal and we can enjoy it, but I can get as much joy now, honestly, out of eating an apple because it's that contact with nature that, that gets me off. Right. That, and that's what raw food gives me. I feel connected to, to whatever nature is, whatever that intelligence intelligence is, which I don't claim to know that created life. Mm-hmm. that put all these things here for us to enjoy for free and easily you know food water air sunshine it's all free it's all easy to find all these things given to us to free it can't be by chance and right. so any anytime i can connect with with nature you know whether it's eating an apple or taking a walk out in the fresh air it just you know it just gets everything in my body going and just it, do you think that's the problem like that, that if people don't if people are eating this like you know, cooked food, processed food diet, that they're disconnected from that? Oh, oh, absolutely. Because they're connected with the world of chemistry. Right. I mean, there's no, there are a few people who probably raise their own cows and slaughter them. And, 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 you know, that's a whole, the whole different than going to the supermarket and buying hamburger, which might have the meat from 300 different cows chopped into one little hamburger right and who knows how many chemicals uh, these cows have been eating you don't even know what you're eating anymore people don't when you buy processed food you have no idea what you're getting you're getting a pretty package that says you know welcome to nature on the outside (laughs) you're getting some piece of crap that came out of a laboratory somewhere (laughs) true (laughs) yeah so um let me talk about let's ask let's talk about your approach to raw food like has has the way that you've eaten this diet changed did you find it uh well let's talk about the start what was your transition like to a raw diet did it take you a long time to kind of change or was it more quick for you so i changed overnight i just committed to it once it once it made sense to my in my mind and i knew i wanted to do it i just changed overnight and it was like being dropped off on an island and okay well now go feed yourself <laughs> and so and so I, I, like I said, I got, I got Sherry's book. Uh, she had her book. Uh, I forget the name of it now, but her first book was out, uh, Living Angels or something like that. Something to do with angels. But I got her book. I got some other books. There's actually, there actually were when I researched it, I found uh, a, a lot of on books on eBay that were written in the twenties and thirties about raw food. It was very popular for a while. Mm-hmm. Uh, before chemistry took over everything, it was very popular. And there was a lot of great books written back there by a lot of great guys. Mm -hmm. And so I studied all that and I I learned how to make things. Uh, Some of it was complicated and some of it, you know, like obviously like eating a banana is not complicated, but some of these recipes were complicated. You had to soak things, sprout things, mix things, had to buy buy a bunch of equipment. I had bought dehydrators, uh, blenders, uh, mixers, uh, you name it. You know, I did every, I just jumped into it full speed and I was making a lot of complicated stuff and it changed and, and, and I, I changed to simplicity. The further I got into it, the more I got into simplicity. I can still enjoy a gourmet meal, but I really appreciate the simplistic uh, raw, raw food 
diet, yeah. lifestyle, whatever you call it that we live now. So I'd say I went into it. I learned as much as I could. I learned all the complicated stuff because that's all it was back then. Right. And, and, and it slowly changed a little bit, but I changed more than it did. I went more for the simplicity. And again, because of meeting my wife, I went in a whole different direction. Yeah. So what, what would a typical day look like for you at the moment? Well, I wake up and I have basically fruit. I'll wake up and the first thing I eat is black garlic. I eat one clove of black garlic. And then um, I'll drink some water. And depending on how I feel, I might drink just a half a glass of water, a full glass of water. Mm -hmm. And then I'll have a few bananas, two or three bananas. And, then, and, then, and I wait in between each one of these foods, probably five to 10 minutes. I let it kind of cycle through a little bit, get out of my esophagus, at least yeah. make, it to the, you know, make it down somewhere. And uh, then I'll usually have an orange or some kind of citrus, but basically it's usually an orange. And then after that, I'll have a date, uh, a, a, a date. Uh, and then after that, I'll have usually a, a big piece of beet. We grow a lot of beets and, mm -hmm. and I, I love the beetroot. I have the beetroot. And then uh, usually I'll stop. And some days I'll mix it up. You know, some days I won't have one. I'll have something different. I might have a persimmon instead of a, yeah. Something else, I might have an apple. But then I'll stop, and then I'll clean my teeth real good. And then, uh, and then I won't have any more food until lunch, usually. I might snack a little bit, but really a little bit. Like, and something really clean, like grapes. I don't want to eat food that's going to gum up my teeth or mm -hmm. leave residue in my throat and mouth to, you know, until I've had my lunch. So I might eat grapes, watermelon, you know, something that is yeah. real clean. And, and then lunch will usually be a salad or a green wrap or a gourmet meal. If Min makes something, feels like making something and she's experimenting, she'll say, here, I'm making this today. Yeah. But I'll eat a big wrap, green wrap or a salad. I try to eat that every day for lunch unless she interferes and then I eat something else. And then usually that's it except for snacks. But often because my wife, she just wants to keep feeding me and feeding me. Often mm -hmm. later in the evening, around four or five o'clock, she'll say, oh, I made this. You got to eat this. You got to help me eat this. I can't do it. <laughs> and so I end up eating some more. But, but my the basic diet now is fruit uh, and salad. And then all vegan as well? Oh, absolutely. Uh -huh. And do you do any supplements, anything on top of that? Nothing. No supplements. No, uh, I don't take any medications. I mean, I would if I needed to, I guess, mm -hmm. but I don't, mm -hmm. I, if I knew I needed to, but, but I, I don't take any supplements. I, I've never been into the supplements. I've never sure. been into the vitamins. So I really don't take any of that stuff. And what was, what's your sort of philosophy on that? Is that, is that from what you've learned? Is it just your own experience or where, where do you stand with all that kind of stuff? Well, my basic stance is this. I don't believe in, in refined foods and, and concentrated foods. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't do juicing. And I get in a lot of arguments with raw foodists, especially people that get started because, oh, you know, they're juicing and they're so into it. And, it, and it's great. It, you know, it has its purpose. Yeah. Uh, if you're fasting or you feel a need or there's a medical reason to juice. But, I mean, in nature, you would never juice. You would never put that concentrated amount of food into your body. So when you're eating vitamins, that's what you're doing. You're putting these isolated, concentrated uh, ingredients, things yeah. into your body. And, and then you're putting them in combinations that your body's not looking to accept. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of these vitamins that offset the other one. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and it's all based on marketing and profits. There's a bit, you'd be hard pressed to find a company that said, Hey, you know, well, we're going to create the greatest vitamin in the world because we just love people. And we don't <laughs> care if we make money or not. We don't care if anybody buys it. We're just going to make, no, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. They start out with the, they start with the marketing first and then develop the product afterwards. So I don't trust it and I don't believe in it. And I think that, my total philosophy, and I wrote a book about it, but it's a very obscure book because I haven't published it. <laughs> because one of the, <laughs> the, the, the greatest knowledge that I found is in obscure books. Go find a copy of the Essene Gospel piece. You know, sure, it's, it's sure. obscure. But, but anyway, uh, and my entire philosophy basically boils down to this. I put my trust in nature. If, if uh, you know, if, if, if something like a giraffe or an elephant can live on leaves 
and blades yeah. of grass, you know, and, and has no concern about where it gets protein or where it gets this and that, you know, then surely, you know, I can do the same. I'm as, I'm, I think I'm as intelligent as an elephant. Maybe, <laughs> maybe not, but, but inside in my body is that same intelligence that's inside the elephant. You can't get around that. We are animals mm. in our bodies. We may be something else in our minds. I mean, we are. But in our bodies, we're, we're, we're more similar than an elephant than we are you know, a whole lot of other things. Yeah. Uh, and, and, uh, and so I just, I just don't put my trust in things that people are selling. Uh, in sure. Their mind. So, so you, you mentioned health philosophy and you've got, I think you've got a DVD that also mentions health, uh, like kind of li li healthy living philosophy. And I'd like to ask you about that. Like, what do you think are the fundamental philosophies ideas that, you, that, that a parent has to embrace to really understand how to live a healthy life well i think the first thing you have to do and i i studied philosophy when i went to college that's what i studied i mm -hmm. don't claim to be a philosopher i'm only in a philosopher in the extent that philosophy is two things it's it's the study of how people think and how they come to conclusions and how they find the truth that's the study of philosophy, and every philosopher usually does it a different way. And then there's the study of philosophers and their individual philosophy. So my, my philosophy about food is basically this. We're living creatures. Mm -hmm. And since the dawn of time, people have been trying to figure out what life is. And nobody has. And nobody ever will. Because it's not something that, that we are given the kind of brain to understand what we even are. We will, yeah. we will, I predict we will never understand what life is. We can describe it. Doctors can say, oh, life starts at conception and blah, blah, blah. But they don't know how it happens. They don't know how it's done. Nobody, nobody can explain how a blade of grass grows. They cannot do it. They can only describe what they can see. And, and I might go off on tangents here, but I got to bring in some other points to make it all clear. Sure. One idea that you need to grasp is this. When you look at anything, whether it's the outside world into outer space or you look into the inner world, it's always expanding. Right. The things that we know today, we didn't know existed before. We didn't know cells existed. We just knew people existed. And then yeah. we knew that people had organs. And then we got down to cells. And then mm -hmm. we got microscopes. And then we said, wait a minute. There's all kinds of stuff in there. And the, the more powerful the, micro, the microscopes get, the more we find this out there and it expands faster than we can learn it. The same thing with outer space. All we knew before was there was a sun and a moon and people looked up and they prayed to it. Now we fly to the outer space and we take people to the moon. And every time we go somewhere, we find out, and every time the telescopes get bigger, we find out that there's more out there to learn than we thought there was before. And it keeps expanding. So actually, on a percentage wise, man is getting less smart as time goes by, because the more we learn, the more we find out that there's more out there than we ever thought existed. So when it comes to life, we don't know what's going on and we never will. And so when, when you just put your trust in nature, mm. then you don't have to worry about these things. I never think about uh, proteins or yeah. Uh, or, or any of this stuff, or vitamins, or uh, where do I get this, or where do I get that? I never think about it, because I don't think it means anything. I can look mm -hmm. at my, I have a grandson, and he eats the worst food on the planet. You know, these <laughs> horrible chips that are full yeah. of, I don't want to mention the brand name, but they're the most popular chip in the world. They make them, you know, everything from barbecue, they have like 12 different flavors. Yeah. And they are so horrible. And they're right on the food shelves, right at eye level where kids can't pass them up. And they're just full of salt and grease and, and uh, processed grains, uh, just terrible stuff, terrible combinations. And he eats it constantly. And when he's not eating that, he's eating pizza and he's washing it down with Coca-Colas. And you know what? He's just a perfect little growing human and the brain is developing and the body's growing, eating total garbage. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, nobody can explain to me how the human body grows and what it needs or what it takes. Now, he may pay for that later on with Claude Darius or Mary, he may not. But nobody's going to 
explain how that body is overcoming all this yeah. and growing into a human being. So I don't think about it. I put my trust in nature and I, and I, and I know that if I'm eating food that came from nature, I can't go wrong. And if I'm eating food that came, if I was going to, or people who are eating food that come from factories or from a warehouse, you're just, you're rolling the dice because you don't know what's in there. You don't know how long it was kept. I've worked in big corporations. I've been around big businesses and I've been retired for 18 years, but I've been in my careers. I've been around some big companies and they'll do anything for a profit. They'll, mm. they'll, they won't, they won't honor expiration dates. They'll say, ah, just sell it, get it out of here, move it. Uh, wow. I mean, some people will, some people won't. And we've seen it over and over again, how, how, how corporations and companies and people, greed will overtake their decision making. So there is no greed in nature. It's just right. nature. It has no agenda. And that's my philosophy is if you just don't even look at it as raw food, look at it as a connection with nature and mm -hmm. with the food that we've been given to eat for free. I mean, amazing. You know, it's so simple when you really get down, like the philosophy, one of the philosophies is like, well, you know, God or whoever you believe, creator, whatever you think, a chance, whatever, however you think this world and we got created, isn't it amazing that everything that we need when we come into this world is out there free? We don't pay for air. We don't pay for water. Not the water that falls from the sky anyway. We don't pay for sunshine. We don't pay for food, it grows. I mean, we pay for it now in this modern century because everything has to go through the system, but it's all been given to us. You know, fruit trees are out there. We didn't, we didn't have to create them. And so if you look at it, well, what would the food that we would be created to eat then? Well, of course it would be the easiest food to get. You know, what kind of a system would make a food that would put you in jeopardy of getting killed by an animal trying to capture that food. No, if some, if a God or nature or chance wanted you to live easily, they would make things like grapes that you could just go pick and eat. Yeah. Pick the leaves and eat the grape leaves, which we grow grapes and eat the leaves and they're fantastic. <laughs> and so anyway, when you, when you really put your trust in nature and you, you look at it from, from many levels, not only philosophy, but just from, from phys physicality, uh, it's just obvious that we're meant to eat living food that came from nature. Mm. And yeah. uh, I don't believe we're we're meant to eat animals. I don't I don't look down on people that eat animals or argue with them or anything like that. But I've just come to believe spiritually and physically, it's just not something that we should be doing. I, I, uh, I oh uh, oh, and the one thing I left out, and then also. You, 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 the Essene core, the Essene philosophy, their, their core philosophy is you cannot kill and you can't kill anything. Not they're, they're said, you can't kill people and you can't kill food. You can't f kill the food that you put into your mouth. So if you take something and you microwave it or you put it in a fire, you're killing it. Yeah. And if there is something in there that your body, some kind of life spirit that your body is going to need, it's going to have a hard time finding it. It's something that you've roasted at 300 degrees for 20 minutes. So, you know, uh, so nature and not cooking, that's my core philosophy, I guess. And I would like to know a little bit about you talking about some of the books and things that you read early on. I'd like to know what, what, what do you think had the most influence on you and do you want to pick out some writings or books or different influences that you had? Sure. Well, I read them all, and I have a hard time remember these names or pronouncing them right. But uh, uh, there was the mucus mucusless diet. Uh, I can't remember his name now, but he uh, he wrote it. Yeah, Arnold Edit. Back. Yeah, right, Arnold Edit. I, that's I don't believe that's his real name, but that's his. Mm -hmm. Anyway, he he. Yeah. And then uh, there was. Uh, there was um, uh, there was there was a lot of them, and I can't because a lot of these were like just one-time articles that were in magazines where people wrote like three and four-page articles about raw right. food. Uh, but actually, 
my biggest influence, I have to say, was the Essene Gospel of Peace. It right. made the most sense to me as far as nutrition, not as far as like religion. It's not really a religious book, but as far as religion or philosophy, it's in there. But basically, what it had to say about food resonated with me more than anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, it basically talks about like not killing your food, not setting fire to your food, sort of that kind of thing. Yeah, it talks about not killing anything, not. Yeah. not killing not killing your food and and it talks about uh i mean everything it said and you know some people believe that the Essene gospel piece was written thousands of years ago and some people believe it was an invention of a man who just did it to make money and came out with it in the 20s or 30s i, I think it came out in the 30s but anyway when he came out with it he was so it was so revolutionary and so ahead of his time and obscure nobody read it Nobody read it back then. Very few people read it now. But everything in there makes perfect sense. And the more I learn about, have learned about raw food, I've still found nothing in there that I can say, oh, no, let's see, this is bullshit. No. Right. Everything makes sense. And whether it came from this man's mind in 1930 or whether it came from thousands of years ago, and he did just interpret it from, from uh, archives in the Vatican like he says he did, uh, I'll take his word on it. But it rings true. It rings true, and and there's a lot of teachings in there. It tells you how to get started, how to what to eat, and it does it in such simplistic terms. Mm. You know, a lot of a lot of the trouble that we're in today in so many areas, not only food, is that say a guy like me or anybody has an idea and they want to get it out there. Well, you got to find a way to make money with it, or you're not going to get it out there. Basically, or you're going to have a hard time getting it out there. And so to do it, they put together a system and then they start adding stuff and selling stuff and making it more complicated. But when mm. you take everything down to its core, which is what the Essene Gospel of Peace teaches, that's, that's where you find the really good stuff. And, and that's not the only source. There's a lot of great books out there. And there's a, you know, and, but a lot of them end up with preparing really complicated stuff. And a lot of them end up trying to sell you supplements because, again, they got to make a living. And I, I totally understand that. It's, it's, it's rough to. Do you think that's what it's all about? Just out of interest, you know, there's, there's been a lot of people in the raw food movement that have sold different supplements and things like that. Do you think that's always been just about them trying to find a way of making a living? Yeah, I do. I do. Mm -hmm. I think that I think that there are people who who understand and learn and, uh, about the benefits of different uh, nutrients and supplements and they might say well this is good for this and if you have a cold this is good to take and i think there's a lot of real good knowledge in that and a real good thing but the thing you have to realize is that all these supplements come from basically one or two places mm. i mean there's a giant place where they have a warehouse and i can call them up or anybody can call them up and they can say hey uh, my name is uh, so and so, and I want to create a supplement, and I want you to put this in there, and this in there, and this in there, and this percentage, and and just make sure that I'm not copying anybody else's. If somebody else's has two percent of this, give me one point five so I can say my formula is unique and different. And then I'll handle the labeling, I'll handle the marketing, and then they put it. You put it in a capsule, put it in a gel, put it in, you know, in a bottle, whatever you want to do. But it all comes from one or two places, and it's all the same stuff, and yeah. it's all based on a profit-making business. It's like saying, you know, do you believe that preachers care about money or do they, are they really interested in God? Well, how do you know? How can you tell? And what does money have to do with God? Well, what does supplements have to do with natural eating, which is right. what every living creature on earth other than us does? Mm. I mean, you know, I tell people only drink water. Unless, you know, once a, I mean, once a, month, we, once a month, my wife makes a big batch of crackers raw crackers and she juices a lot of carrots to get the pulp mm -hmm. to, to make as the base for the crackers and so i drink some carrot juice once a month now is it going to kill me or hurt me no hopefully not but i don't believe in juicing and i don't juice on a regular basis and and every other living creature on this planet every single one of them only drinks water yeah every one every creature on earth except for us and so, you know, what makes us think that we need something more than water or that your body's looking for something? So I drink only water. And like I say, I'll have a juice once a month. Or if I'm at a social gathering among raw food, it's a celebration or party and they're serving juice, I'll certainly partake and enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, uh, 
yeah, uh, simplicity. So let me ask you about within the raw food movement or community of uh, have you been to a lot of different events and restaurants and things and and met a lot of people in the movement? Like what what's what's been your yeah. your, your experiences like? Well, I met them all. Because when I first found, when I, the first uh, raw food uh, uh, gatherings uh, were out in Arizona, in uh, Sedona, Arizona, by uh, a, a gal, and her name is Happy. And she started the raw food festivals. And right. I didn't, the first one had just concluded when I found out about it. But the first one was really in like a meeting of eight people around a creek. And, uh, <laughs> but anyway, at, and, and so... Uh, I met Happy. My wife made a food for made a, a meal for her, and I'll never forget what happened to Happy. She couldn't. We were there with her, her and a, a, an associate that she had brought along, and my wife and I. We were in Sedona, Arizona, and Min made a meal for her. And after she took like two bites, she couldn't speak. She had never tasted anything like this wow. food, and she'll tell you this herself. And mm -hmm. and. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, anyway, and so we we did a demonstration, and we had a booth at that at the second raw food festival, and we had from then on until they ended, until they stopped having them, we had a, a, a booth there, and a lot of raw fooders came to my farm. I met them all. I met every single one of them that you can name. I met them all, talked with them all, uh, got along with some of them, didn't get along with a lot of them. Uh, <laughs> really. Uh, yeah, learned from some of them, kind of looked at some of them and said, well, I don't want to learn whatever they're doing. And it, I mean, it's a you know vast uh, spectrum of, of personalities. Yeah. But anyway, I learned them all and I went to every single raw restaurant. My wife and I, we went around the country doing demonstrations. Yeah. And we would typically go somewhere like, uh, you know, name a city. We'd go there on a Friday night and do a free talk. And then we'd have a, we'd charge people to come to a, a, a two days of classes where we taught them how to make the food mm -hmm. and and so uh, we got to know every raw foodist every raw food restaurant as they were popping up we consulted with many of them because we i mean if we go into a raw food restaurant i remember going into uh uh, uh i can't think of the name of it but it was uh, it'll come to me in a second here it's a lady's name it was in san francisco and it was the most gourmet elaborate raw food register ever created and it was basically a hobby and uh and i wanted to learn see their kitchen because this is the type of place you went in they had tablecloths there was a piano player in the corner playing you know music wow. candles on the table an average meal was about fifty dollars mm -hmm. uh but it was it was oh thank you my here's my honey just bring in some pomegranate want to say hi <laughs> Hi, man. Hi, nice to see you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Oh, Rock speaking. Sands. The, the name of the place was Rock Sands. Min and I were there. I'm telling you about the time we went to San Francisco with Greg to the restaurant, the, the fancy yeah. restaurant. Anyway, uh, and so we wanted to see the kitchen, and they had a big sign, you know, nobody's allowed in the kitchen. So yeah, we made up a story that it was, I think it was Min's birthday, and we started taking pictures, and we said, oh, can't we? <laughs> Just take a picture. We ended up in the kitchen taking pictures of everything in the kitchen so wow. I could see how their operation was. But, but okay, bye. Uh, thank you. We, uh, we went in, and every time we found out about a restaurant opening, we'd go there. Even if we had to drive a couple thousand miles to get there, we'd go there to meet the owners, to find out about it, to see what they were doing. And it was just something nice. we wanted to do because, uh, yeah. Mm. So I saw it all. Yeah, it's... Uh... It's it's some there's a great community of people really. Do you feel that like it's a, it's always a it's a really something about the raw food community is really interesting and attracts a lot of cool people. Yeah, it's it attracts a lot of cool people, a lot of interesting people. But I have to say this, and without mentioning you know, individual names, among the people that are raw food personalities. Mm -hmm. That's where I got met some really disturbing people that uh, I didn't like. I didn't like what they were doing. I saw through, I see through what they're doing. And I've met some great people. You know, I've met some great people. And, uh, but it's like any other business. You know, you can find an honest used car salesman out there. You got to look really hard, but you'll find one somewhere. But 99% of them are dishonest. Well, probably the majority of raw food personalities and people promoting it are really nice honest people but there's a lot that really aren't 
sure. that's all I really want to say about that. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, You've got like an interesting background. We've not talked about this, but you were a, a musician. You had a band. I, th I believe the band was named after your surname. Let me connect me with the right uh, pronunciation, Scuro or Scuro. That's um, pretty close. You're a violin player. Yes. And, and from what I've seen you post before, you, you, you uh, um, played some pretty cool gigs back in the day and supported different bands and uh, get the feeling you had a bit of an audience yourself as well. I don't know the full story, but I'd like to hear no, more about it. Well, basically what happened was I was, uh, I was going to, I had finished high school. I was going to college and everybody was playing music back then. I think I was like 15 when 14 or 15 when the Beatles hit and the Rolling Stones. And so we all grew up crazy with the music and the hippies and everything. And I had long hair and I was a hippie. And uh, I was, I had been playing music pretty much all my life. I, I started playing when I heard Bob Dylan, I think I was about 13 years old. And I started, mm -hmm. I started playing the violin when I was about five. But when I was about 13, I heard Bob Dylan and then I ran, I had to get a guitar. Mm -hmm. and I put down the violin and started playing the guitar. And everybody had a guitar back then. Uh, we were all musicians. And some of us actually were, and some of us actually weren't. And I don't know if I was a born musician, but I worked real hard at it. And I, I wrote some songs and I, I went into a, a concert promoter office one day with a tape of four songs that I had written and I played them for him. And he looked at me and he said, let's put a band together. He said, let's, why don't you put a band together and I'll be your manager. And he was one of the largest concert promoters in the United States. He was booking the tours for all the big bands from Jethro Tull to I mean, wow. you name it, all the big bands. He would book their tours around the United States or in certain sections of the United States. So anyway, I, I, I jumped on the opportunity. I put a band together and I revolved it around my violin playing and the songs that I had written. And consequently, because he was the, the, uh, the, the uh, booking these tours and he was managing us, he would, he would have us be the opening act we would be playing while people were, the lights were on and people were finding their seats, you know, and kind of looking right. at us. Sometimes they'd pay attention, but sometimes, and usually it would be like three or four bands. It would be like a Grand Funk Railroad, Freddie King, Elvin Bishop, and Scaro would be down at the bottom because nobody knew who we were. But, but, and then sometimes in some towns, it would just be like the, the main band, like Jethro Tall and us. And so people did pay attention to us because there was only two bands. And so we would start playing, you know, when the lights went out. But anyway, because we had this great manager who had all these connections and all these tours, we got all this promotion that we probably would have never had or didn't certainly didn't mm -hmm. deserve on the merits of our tunes. But so we ended up traveling all through the United States on many different tours of some of the greatest bands in the world. And we got to know some of them. Some of them we didn't. And but we got to play on stage with them and see how they operated. And we, uh, London Records signed us to a contract and they put out some, uh, some feelers. They released some songs of ours in some selected markets and they didn't do very well. And so they didn't keep us or record an album with us. But I had three years of, you know, living the rock and roll lifestyle, touring the United States, playing big places, you know, 20, 25,000 seats sometime auditoriums. My the goodness, smallest, wow. Yeah, the smallest venues we, we would have played would have been like, you know, maybe 5,000 people. Um, That's incredible. And, uh, yeah, and it was a, just a great time. And I still play. I still play my fiddle. I play a lot of bluegrass now and jazz. And I just, music is one of those things that keeps your mind, you know, mm. keeps your mind sharp. I've got a friend who's a huge Jethro Tull fan. I'm sure he'll be very jealous when I tell him this story. Yeah, <laughs> Jethro Tull put out a put out a uh, 40, I don't have it in front of me, but here, but it's, it put out a 40 or a 50 year thick as a brick uh, mm -hmm. package. And it's, uh, it's not many people have it because I think it's about $50, but it's a CD and then it's a booklet. And in that booklet, they show some posters and stuff from their different, and there we are. There's oh, wow. a poster, Jethro Tall and Scaro in their book. Nice. And I'm, it's like one of my, I could show people and say, look, I really did do this. <laughs> What were some of the other acts you played with that you remember? Uh, we played with the Rare Earth. We played with Freddie King, Grand Funk Railroad, Jethro Tell, Elvin Bishop, uh, Savoy Brown, a band from, I believe, England. Um, sure. Uh, Leon Russell. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. I know I'm going to forget a lot of them. Um, Those are the ones that come to mind. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Really cool. And and you said you 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 ended up. um, How did you make that transition? Ended up working for a resort. Well, my my family, my my father my grandfather were in the casino business they mm-hmm. owned and operated casinos and so uh everybody in my family my brother my mother my father my grandfather my everybody was connected to gambling and uh we uh ended up in las vegas 1955 uh my my father used to operate illegal casinos back in kentucky mm-hmm. and uh big casinos bigger than the ones that were in las vegas in those days and anyway, and when they closed down the illegal casinos, we moved out to Las Vegas, but we were still in the gambling business. And so as when I moved to Las Vegas, it was so small, you wouldn't even believe what it, I mean, there was on the strip where all these resorts are, there wasn't even sidewalks. It was just desert and a, and right. a hotel there. And anyway, so as growing up, there was always opportunities for me to go into the gambling business because I already knew it inside out. Mm -hmm. I had started working with dice when I was a kid. My father had (laughs) all the training equipment in the basement to train people to be dealers and that. And so I used to play with that stuff and help him teach. And so anyway, so after the band failed or, or we didn't, I didn't want to pursue it anymore. I, you know, I had this golden opportunity to go walk into the, the casino resort business. And so mm-hmm. I did. And I ended up, I started basically at the bottom as a dealer and I ended up being an executive with the MGM Grand. Uh, the original MGM was the biggest casino in the world at that time. And then after uh, they had a real tragic fire there, I think about 75 people died there. And, and uh, we were closed down for about nine months. I still worked for the corporation, but after they reopened, I just did my heart wasn't in it and I was looking for something else. And a gentleman, he's passed away now, who invented the video poker machine, he called me one day and he said, Ronnie, I'm building a big resort up in this town of Mesquite. There's nothing up there now. It's about an hour north of Las Vegas. And it's a nice little town on a river. And I bought a big piece of land up there and I'm going to build a huge resort. And uh, I helped him do it. And I worked for him for 18 years. And even though my expertise was in gaming, I had to learn as much as I could and everything I could about food and restaurants and hotels because you know, we had to make this place work. And, and so uh, that's how I got into it. And I, my, I wouldn't say my heart was in it, but it was, a, it was a good way to make a living. I loved living in this little town in Mesquite mm. and I could pursue my philosophical and agricultural ambitions and uh, while I was doing this and so I did that for a long time and then uh, and then retired from it and 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 what did you learn much uh, with all your experience for people out there who might be interested in you know putting together a some kind of a maybe a resort maybe a restaurant maybe something for raw food do you have any advice or ideas oh you bet I do you bet I do we have a we have a whole formula for what we believe will transform, but not transform, but give people, United States now, you've got a choice between eight different f- big food chains that are all serving the same junk, whether it's pizza or hamburgers mm-hmm. or Mexican, it's fried chicken, it's basically the same stuff. It's grease, salt, sugar, fat. I mean, you, you, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. There's been many uh, 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 documentaries made about what's going on in the food business, but all that's out there is junk for many reasons. But we, and the main reason is money because it's cheaper to sell junk. It's better to sell junk. People will eat junk more than they'll eat healthy food. And so because of money, our, our food system is just uh, turned into a cesspool. But ever since day one, because my original way, as I told you earlier, that I got into raw food was because I wanted to open up a vegan restaurant because, and it's not about the money. That's not my motivation. The money has to, you have to make it profitable to expand. Otherwise, you're going to have one restaurant and go out of business. So you have to make something that's profitable. But that's just for the purpose so you can expand it around the world. But I've never given up on my idea of putting food out there that would be healthy and could compete with fast food hamburgers and pizza. Mm -hmm. And I have it. I have that formula. And we're going to find a way to get it out there, whether we do it ourselves. I don't want to because I'm 71 years old and I'm playing music 
you know, six hours a day. I'm farming. I'm really busy. So I don't really have it in me to do it, but I'll find somebody who does. And we're going to start this thing. And we're going to start it in Las Vegas because people from all over the world come to Las Vegas and it's the perfect place to start a franchise. And I guarantee you with, within this next year, because a lot of things are in the works right now, we will, we will kick off this franchise and you will see a food that you've never been exposed to before that, uh, that sounds exciting. That people will accept. Yeah, that sounds exciting. I'd love to. I'd love to hear more about that. When, when, it'd be, it'd be good to do another one of these. Maybe when you're further down that line, or, or, it'd be great to be able to uh, invite people to that. Um, let's talk about. You live in Arizona. You have uh, a, bre- a bed and breakfast. Would you like to let people know a little bit about about that? Well, I don't like to. I don't like to force it on people because some people it's like religion. They get turned off right away. And a lot. And one thing I've learned from from teaching, from going around with my wife doing stre- demonstrations, is people don't like to be told what to do. Mm-hmm. And especially when it comes to personal habits and mm-hmm. food, and, that, and nothing's more personal than eating. And so, uh, uh, I'm sorry. What was the original question? Well, uh, the, the question was about your bed and breakfast and. And what would you, oh so yeah. so so when people come there, I for a while I was leaving our DVDs on the table with a bowl of fruit, mm-hmm. and nobody ever took our DVDs. And I thought, well, you, you know, I so we did sell actually, you know, thousands of these DVDs. Uh, there was when the interest raw food was really happening, it was a big interest. But I'll leave them on the tables. No, no, I think one person out of a hundred, you know, took our D, took one of our DVDs. Yeah. Uh, very few people ever ate the fruit, you know. And so, if I usually, when somebody rents it, I'll see their profile first and have to accept whether we'll allow them to stay there because we don't want partiers. Uh, yeah, you know, we don't want uh, uh, you know th- other things. We just want people to come and enjoy our our farm. And so, if I if I feel like someone's open to it and wants to hear about it, then. You know, I might tell them if I talk too much, raise your hand because it's hard to stop me once I get going. About it. <laughs> but but uh, yeah, if somebody wants to hear about it, then I'm, you know, I'm, I'm ready to, to fire. But if if they show any occasion, they don't want to hear about it. I just I just yeah. say, well, enjoy the place. And if if people want to reach out to you after this, if they'd like to get in touch or maybe find your your books or DVDs and things like that, how can they find you? Well, they can find me personally. They can email me at. Well, I'm on Facebook. They can find me on Facebook uh, under my name, R. Scuro, S-K-U-R-O-W. They can go to our website, which is uh, U, the letter U, the letter B, R-A-W dot com, U-B-R-A-W.com. But all that you'll find there, there is our DVDs for sale. We sell them now downstream, I think, for $10. Uh, But they could contact me on Facebook or they they could email me. Uh, rscaro at yahoo.com and we're happy to help anybody as as time and opportunity permits excellent excellent so before we've, we've been going about an hour which is uh, really appreciate you the time you've given us um what would be your last kind of thoughts before we bring this to a close your last pieces of advice for people that are uh, curious about the raw food lifestyle or getting into it you want to learn more about it yeah well, I guess I would say, number one, you know, love yourself, love yourself, take care of yourself. And the best way to do that is to immediately get in touch with nature. You know, don't accept yeah. anything except for fresh air. Uh, don't accept anything except for clear sunshine. Don't accept anything except for clean water. And don't accept anything for clean, except for clean food coming into your body. And, you know, Rather than give specific things like say eat this or eat that, I'd say just you know avoid things in packages as much as you can. Look at the food. Go into a supermarket. Just ask yourself. Look at the food and say, well, did this come from nature or did this come from a factory somewhere? If it came from a factory, just put it down. No matter what it says, no matter what they're telling you, no matter how many antioxidants and probiotics are in there, just put it down. And, and, and just realize that it's like learning music, or learning a new instrument, or learning a new language. You're going to have to learn some new things to, to love yourself. 
Sure. And simplicity. Keep it simple. Learn from all these people. Realize that there's some people are just trying to make money. Some people are really just trying to put their heart out there. And, and, and some people are, you know, like me, you know, I'm doing this out of my heart, but I might be wrong. You know, I could be wrong. Maybe I should be taking supplements. I'm not, I'm not saying I'm right. I'm just telling you how I live and how, what we do. But listen to your inner body. Love yourself. Keep it simple. Get in touch with nature. And when you do that, raw food is just going to come naturally because mm -hmm. it is nature. And you'll figure it out. You'll be able to live on food and lettuce and a salad until you can figure out how to make a raw food pizza or whatever it's going to hit your comfort zone. You'll figure mm -hmm. that out. But keep it simple because in, every, in everything, whether it's business or art, it's always simplicity that, that ends up being one of the key factors. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Ronnie, for joining us today. Uh, for everyone that wants to connect, you can go to ubraw.com to, to find out more and, and if you want to communicate with Ronnie as well. He's on Facebook, as he was saying. Um, and if you want to keep in touch with us, the raw food, uh, sort of the Love Fruit podcast, you can go to fruitfest.co.uk and you can join our newsletter there um, to, to stay in touch. And there's also a shop there if you want to donate to us or, or get one of our um, T-shirts or hoodies or whatever. We appreciate that. Yeah, but thank you for listening and watching the raw food. Uh, the, sorry, I keep on saying the wrong thing. The, the Love Fruit podcast. And we'll see you in the next episode. Thank you very much.